Good morning. I think um, we will get started. Uh, we've got a lot of uh, speakers this morning, so uh, welcome uh, to today's uh, Stokel Center seminar. We apologize if there were some issues with the uh, invite distribution. Um, never a dull moment, but uh, looks like we've got a good crowd uh, in attendance virtually sort of here. Um, we will be uh, doing the Stokel Center seminars the fourth Friday. We'll be taking uh, a break around the holiday uh, season um, on those fourth Fridays, but we will be uh, returning in uh, January with Dr. Uh, Van Coven and the writer's workshop that she normally does. Our Sandler Scholar will be uh, virtually visiting us from uh, Houston, Texas. And uh, then Dr. Helen Delacasios and her uh, Lifestyle Medicine crew will be uh, talking to us in March. So good lineup. So keep your eye out for the invites. Um, I'm going to quick uh, introduce our speakers and uh, then turn it over uh, to Dr. Horn. Um, last month, for those of you who are in attendance, you know that we did a tribute to Dr. John Stokel, uh, who we uh, lost in April of this year. And that clearly seemed to be the uh, most obvious and important thing to kick our series off with when we came to think about what the next most important primary care innovation topic might be, uh, certainly telehealth uh, rose to the top. And you're gonna hear from people who led those efforts uh, here uh, across the system and uh, really sort of helped us uh, reach out to our patients during uh, the COVID surge. So my pleasure to introduce uh, our following speakers from the Department of uh, Neurology, Dr. Lee Schwamm, uh, who's also Vice President of uh, Virtual Care Digital Health at the Mass General Brigham, uh, Dr. Uh, Daniel Horn from the uh, Division of General Internal Medicine, who's also Director of Population Health and Quality, Dr. Andrew Wong, uh, also uh, from Division of General Internal Medicine and the Internal Medicine Associates, who is a DGIM Innovation Fellow. And uh, pre-recorded, uh, we will have Dr. Uh, Jacob Merksky, uh, who is Co-Director of the Core Health and Revere Health Center. So turn it over, uh, Dr. Horn. Thanks so much, uh, Bill, for uh, inviting us to put this presentation together. And um, I am going to take two minutes to frame, and I, I have the honor of, of playing MC for this amazing lineup that we have um, for you today. Let me pull up my slides. Um, and, you know, uh, Mostly, you know, my job is to say that the people who you're going to hear from, you guys see my slides? Can you get a nod? Okay, great. Yeah. Um, the people you're going to hear from are the people who led all this work through the surge, and we will look to to lead it into the future. Um, you know, Lee uh, has led the Master General Brigham System Strategy and stood up a tremendous effort in a, in a crisis um, that really allowed us to prevail in providing care through the surge and will allow us to uh, grow telehealth capacity and virtual care capacity across our system um, uh, you know, into the future. And Andrew Wang had played an incredible role you know, making sure that primary care knew how to do virtual care through the surge. And we'll, um, you know, we're delighted to say that he'll be staying on to work on the telehealth space and primary care uh, moving forward in a faculty role. And then Jacob, um, uh, you know, sort of stood up and rapidly transitioned his group visit model uh, into the virtual care space. And I thought it'd be really fun to hear about uh, the work that he did through COVID to launch virtual group visits and a model that I think is, you know, among first in the nation uh, approach and I think shows our leadership. Um, but in general, my sort of uh, final uh, comment before we kick off the lineup is just to say, you know, typically we would reflect before we innovate. Um, and uh, I would say we, uh, you know, through the surge, because we had to, to some degree, innovated <laughs> without reflection. We had to get this done. And I invite you to take the next hour and listen and reflect now and think about um, the future of telehealth and primary care and what, where we want to go. Because as you'll see, we did a lot but we don't yet know kind of what works and you know what the 
um, kind of outside of a crisis, what the approach to telehealth should be. And so um, this is a moment to breathe and exhale and um, learn and then think and help us think about what to do next. I'll turn it over to Lee. Great, well, thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> let me see if you stop sharing, maybe I can share my screen. There we go. Great, so uh, thank you so much for inviting me to be here. Let me uh, find my... Um, mm, sorry, show all windows. Okay, share. I'm gonna be real quick and I'm gonna move through a whole bunch of slides. So uh, you tell me, can you see my screen? You able to see my screen? Yeah, okay, I see heads nodding. Great, well, a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Dan and Bill and others. Uh, you know, I can't uh, give a talk about the Stokel Center without reflecting for a moment on my own uh, experience with John, who I knew since I was an intern and resident uh, at MGH. Uh, featured here with his many good friends, but the thing I think I'll remember the most is for uh, probably a decade at least, when you'd see John in the hall, you would get a greeting like, uh, greetings Centurion, or various other <laughs> amusing <laughs> salutations. So uh, always expanding my vocabulary. The foundational principles for virtual care uh, and the mission of the virtual care uh, program has always been for every patient enabling access to reliable health care whenever, wherever, and however it's needed. And I would just, I'm going to start bolding the word every because we really do care about making sure that digital health fits everyone's uh, needs and that we can reach people regardless of where they are on the digital spectrum. Um, it's a suite of programs inside the digital health portfolio alongside EPIC. And the goal is really to add value at that interface between patients and doctors or providers where technology is, the, is that uh, portal through which the care is delivered. Whatever we deployed during COVID has to evolve. As Dan said, it was, a, it was an emergency uh, situation. We stood things up as fast as we could and we'll leverage really intense collaboration and an integration first approach. Integrate this into the work we do, into our existing governance structures, into our existing uh, digital health tools and to maximize the value which is to increase the quality and lower the cost we will seek to standardize wherever possible across the enterprise so we can really support what we put out there um, and uh, we'll do that with intense collaboration and dynamic input from everybody so pre-covid virtual care was a boutique activity uh, many said it wasn't even ready for for primary care the tools were immature the environment was uncertain um, and we did you know, a fair amount of e-consults. We did a bunch of e-visits with Healthcare 360, but we were transitioning to Epic and that program has had a bunch of hiccups from a technology perspective. And we had some niche programs uh, in a couple of departments doing consults to other hospitals and a handful of providers at MGH, about 300 or so doing virtual visits. Um, I'm often asked, you know, what was the, you know, who in your company was the driving force for innovation and change? Uh, and the answer is, uh, none of the individuals, it was COVID-19 that really moved us forward. So from uh, February through the peak of the pandemic, we went from 0.2% of all virtual care uh, at, at MGB wide to 62% being delivered virtually in six weeks. Over 1.2 million virtual visits have occurred. For MGH itself, 200,000 in the last three months. You can see that Integrated video visits make up about 60% now of all visits. Still 30% are being conducted by phone. And we know there are potentially significant equity issues in terms of who can use a phone, both traditional social determinants of health as well as age. Our older patients sometimes struggle and those with cognitive or physical impairments. But you can see MGH peaked at 63% and is now hovering at 30% of all visits. Ignore the next three months because visits aren't typically converted to virtual uh, until a week or two beforehand. So the easier it is to use, like a telephone, the less secure it is. The harder it is to use, but the safer and the most satisfying and the most uh, integrated into our scheduling and billing infrastructure, the harder it is to use. So the most secure is the hardest to use. Once you get it going, it works great. But getting over that energy of activation barrier can be very challenging. 
The four main streams of work from a participant perspective are provider to provider, either emergency situations like an acute stroke or routine consultation to providers at other hospitals. That can be virtual or asynchronous with uh, uh, e-consults. Patient directly to provider, that's our typical platform of uh, virtual visits on a tablet or a laptop or a smartphone, or the VIX platform, which was our video intercom system inside a patient's room. The patient connect platform that allowed family members to visit with patients who were sick in the ICU or have family meetings. And then lastly, automation, the use of health bots or artificial intelligence algorithms to uh, improve the process of care. From an organizational perspective, the central team at MGB is organized around supporting inpatient projects, ambulatory products, and then there's a whole technology support and development uh, and strategy division. But this is the primary interface. People come to us because they have an ambulatory concern or project or desire or an inpatient one. So what is competency in this new era? Dan sort of alluded, one of those moments of reflection is how do you compare traditional in-person education to virtual care. How many of your residents did their first clinics virtually and never saw a patient in person in outpatient clinic uh, until now? Um, and, and how do we think about that? Well, I looked up the definition of competence and you know, the ability to do something successfully or efficiently I thought was really appropriate. Uh, the, an income large enough to live on, typically unearned, did not seem relevant to primary care. Um, I thought that was a particularly entertaining definition of competence. We really need to figure out what are the core competencies. Um, and is it an entrustable professional activity approach or is it start with the five pound weight, go to the 10 pound weight, go to the 15 pound weight? So we held a symposium, a national symposium in September uh, called Crossing the Virtual Chasm. Uh, uh, Susan and others uh, from the center were participants. If you go to virtualcarecompetency.com, you can see recordings of all the sessions. Uh, they were focused on uh, issues ranging from how to assess competency, in terms of frameworks, best practices in the delivery of care, how to supervise uh, in the setting of virtual care, as well as a whole session devoted to equity. I encourage you to take a look if it's of interest to you. AAMC, we've worked as well with the AAMC. Several of the members from our symposium were uh, partners with that, as was uh, Emily Hayden from the emergency department. And they have just released their core framework for thinking about what are the expected uh, entrustable competencies at those entering residency, entering practice, or an experienced faculty physician, and they identified six domains of competency assessment. So this work is actually taking root and I think will be very important for the Department of Medicine to think about, again, given the dominant number of practitioners and trainees in the department. Happy, by the way, to make these slides available to you uh, afterwards. So how do we rethink assessment? So uh, how do you think about assessment when virtual care is both the vehicle by which you're uh, doing the assessment and the environment in which you're practicing? It might be that uh, doing a competency assessment of a trainee interacting with a patient over virtual visit is ideally suited to a virtual supervisor who's inobtrusively watching the encounter with their camera turned off with the patient aware that they're present. That's probably the best way to see the true environment of, of care. But when you're doing that, you need to be expert in how to deliver care in a remote environment or assess care in a remote environment. So that requires, uh, we think, some additional uh, careful thinking. And how do we ensure the quality of virtual care? Well, I think we all uh, hold as the North Star the steep criteria. And I would say, um, based on how we've done so far, I think we get a green bar for the care being timely, effective, efficient, and patient-centered. You might argue that effective we haven't quite nailed yet because we don't have large scale studies to show that virtual care practice is actually you know, uh, effective, but I think most of us would agree for cognitive care, it's likely that it's equally efficacious. Safe, I think we're still struggling, uh, maintaining security and privacy, but still being accessible. Uh, I think we're in the yellow zone there. We're working on it, we have a contract pending with Doximity that we hope will address many of the issues around simplicity while preserving privacy. But equity, I would give us a red bar. I, I just don't think that we have proven that we can deliver care and access that doesn't vary in quality because of the personal characteristics of the patient or the provider. We have providers who aren't doing this because they either don't feel comfortable or they don't want to. We have patients who either don't know 
how to do it, don't know that they can have it as a option, or lack the available technology, bandwidth, access, finances to do it successfully. So that has to change. I'm happy to say that the um, structural racism work at this MGB level has earmarked a significant amount of money to try to address this issue of digital uh, patient experience and digital equity. So you think about measuring quality, well, we'll just go back to our, again, our North Star of the Donabedian framework, think about structure, process, and outcome. So what might those look like? Well, web-enabled devices, adequate bandwidth, secure connectivity, professional settings, payment parity, on-demand support, a resource center for providers. That, those might be structures that we think about as important components of quality. Processes would be, is it appropriate for virtual care? Is the patient and family engaged properly? Are, do, are you offering hours that are um, structures and processes that allow patients to engage successfully? Uh, do we look at variation uh, in practice? across providers, the hidden versus the actual efficiencies of delivering the care this way. Hidden, I mean, we never typically count how many hours it takes the patient to get to us and the true out-of-pocket costs for patients. Uh, what about asynchronous transactions? How are they, how do they play a role in this process of care? And what is the quality of the documentation? Is it as good? Does MedRec get thrown out the window? You know, you're not measuring vital signs unless you have the patient measure vital signs. So those are all processes. And then for outcomes, I think all, you know, all the traditional outcomes, but maybe novel outcomes as well, like equity targets, or like I said, patient total cost. Uh, those are all important things to think about as you reflect. And then how do we adapt teaching and learning in a virtual care environment? What are the strategies that are the, you know, uh, the Darwinian strategies that will win out and those best practices like uh, virtual group visits that Daniel was alluding to? And how can excellence in teaching and learning succeed in a virtual environment? Who become our, our, our excellent, our, you know, our go-to teachers when it comes to the virtual environment? We, uh, we launched something called Virtual Rounds. It was largely adopted on neurology and a few of the medical services, uh, made its way around some of the other hospitals. At the, at the early days of the pandemic, when providers had to be quarantined for a couple of weeks prior to um, uh, being getting test results back, and we didn't really know how, how big this was gonna be. We had whole teams of providers, 10 providers, eight providers wiped out in a single day. So we quickly switched to having only two people on physical rounds and using a workstation on wheels and uh, smartphones to connect everybody else, either in the hospital and sitting around in you know, various conference rooms or actually working from home. Many of our quarantine residents who weren't ill continued to work from home on rounds. And you can see here, it's an example I'm visiting as a guest, here's the attending, uh, here's the resident uh, in the hallway, here's the resident at the bedside, here are two residents working from home. They're reviewing an EEG of a patient on the neurology service and here's the epilepsy expert beamed in just for this question who points out there's a phase reversing spike and this is likely a patient with seizures. You know, thinking about how we can move forward, what can we learn from this epidemic? Well, we learned that we can bring expertise on demand inside not just outside the walls of the institution. And so there's valuable lessons here about digitally upscaling our concept of how we connect uh, patients and providers. This was the VIX platform, the video intercom system. Here's a, just a, a, a fake patient with the um, iPad clamped to the IV pole in the room. You can see it's attached with a marine uh, clamp here that was designed for boating. Here it is sitting on an IV pole outside of the patient's room. Here's a Volt phone. Uh, being used to access it instantly. This platform is being completely redone on a more stable Zoom-based um, uh, software platform um, and is being piloted as we speak on multiple units at the MGH and across MGB to be ready for a second surge. And then keeping the patient in the center. You know, we talked about structural inequity. Uh, keeping the patient in the center is hard enough in real life. In the virtual world, not only do you need to engage the support Port network of that patient, but you now have not only the specialist, the PCP, but the educator, the interpreter, the person monitoring the vital signs remotely, the IT support person for the providers. All these people need access to the patient and we need to choreograph that in new ways because we don't have the luxury of the patient standing in the office work, working their way down the line of the various people they need to see. So, you know, as we move more and more care to a digital world, and that's not just virtual care, it's all of the other stuff that we're doing, we have to make sure our patient gateway doesn't become actually just a gate and that, sorry, you know, you're not 
worthy of entering you're not allowed to enter or come on in but if you can't find the front door i'm sorry you know there's no map um i i really like this uh cartoon here about equality versus equity versus social justice and you know here's reality here um we have a long way to go and let's just make sure virtual care isn't you know stacking up the boxes uh, on the wrong side of the of the fence um every time i think we figured out the equity issue uh two more show up so it's not a war we're going to win quickly um every time you think you have a solution there's a new problem so it's gonna just take a tenacious and relentless effort to be successful there. We know from other groups that uh, inequities emerged quickly when they shifted to virtual based on age, race, uh, as well as gender and primary language spoken. And we wanna make sure we don't replicate that. We can virtually, we can geocode our virtual visits so we can know what neighborhoods are consuming virtual visits to a greater degree. And we can map that against other uh, features like where patients are, uh, you know, are um, uh, registered for gateway, where the vulnerable communities are. And we think this geo-coded uh, application is going to be very useful for us. So the strategies that we need are uh, we have to have dashboards that measure variation in adoption. And I've, uh, we've done that. We've built those dashboards. We have those filters. And we're getting ready to start creating uh, standard reports that are going to go out monthly. Um, and we have to think about people who have limited English proficiency, digital literacy, access to technology and Wi-Fi, or visual, cognitive, and physical impairments. All these people have challenges that we have to think about. This is the Patient Connect platform that we built that's now uh, started at MGH and is now partners wide. It's called Patient Connect. If you don't speak English and you want to have a secure uh, video chat with the team or your loved one, uh, Previously, it was very hard to do this. Now, all we need to do is convey to that family member the 10-digit passcode in the meeting ID for the visit. And then they just log into this website, pick the language that they speak, and it explains in their native language what to do and how to put the number in. And then when they submit that, we have software on the back end that assembles a Zoom call and connects them. And that's been extremely popular, and we're working to make that even simpler. So, in summary, I think the future for virtual care is bright. Uh, there are major barriers uh, that we still have to address, like you know, payment, reimbursement, access, et cetera. The challenges for equity, competency, and quality assessment are very real, and we need to grapple with them directly, not just assume that people will handle them on their own. Training is a whole new ballgame, and that's not just our trainees, but our faculty. It's like introducing a new stethoscope that no one's ever used before. We, Got to make sure everyone knows how to use it, not just the people graduating medical school. And how we mature from these COVID-driven explosive growth to what I would call more curated virtual care solutions that seamlessly integrate with our traditional ways of caring for patients, that will be critical. That will be how we are judged. So uh, with that, uh, the dog tour will see you now. This is perhaps the future uh, of uh, medical care in the 21st century. Um, and I'm getting that, that very sweet face from Susan Edgman Levitan about the cute little dog. So thank you, Susan. Um, I'll stop here, Dan. I'm happy to take a question or two, but then I do have to peel off and uh, do another call. Thanks so much, Lee. I think we'll keep moving because Andrew's got a, a, a big talk and uh, yeah. that was really great. Thank you so much for joining us. That was a really helpful framing. Terrific. Good luck, guys. Thanks so much. All right, um, so my name is Andrew Hong. It's a pleasure being here to talk to you about telehealth innovation in primary care. Um, I assume you can all see my slides, correct? Um, great. So uh, just as a quick background, kind of Lee touched upon this, but this virtual business did exist pre kind of COVID at MGH, but mostly just uh, used by specialists. And the COVID-19 pandemic has really been the major catalyst for adoption in primary care. And we think even uh, beyond the pandemic uh, period, there's an important part that uh, telehealth can play in our primary care kind of care delivery model. So three things I wanna focus on uh, as part of my talk. Uh, one is just reviewing the primary care specific kind of utilization data with a kind of a highlighting uh, the, some of the disparities that uh, Lee uh, alluded to earlier. And then also discussing kind of how we envision primary care, uh, kind of telehealth and primary care will evolve over time. So you, if you look at the national trend in ambulatory visits, um, this is kind of uh, breaking, bro broken down into office visits in blue versus uh, telehealth visits in green, 
you can see this kind of major exponential growth in, in um, our, our March of tel uh, telehealth visits with kind of uh, gradual drop down into like a plateau level uh, into the summer. And it, like, this is remarkably similar to what we uh, saw at MGH. This is just for primary care, the, the, this exponential growth uh, starting in March. And then for us, the drop down really started happening in July when kind of the stage uh, two of the uh, reopening process happened. But there's just the overall kind of trend and pattern is very similar to, to what was happening nationally. So this is uh, kind of more recent months from July to September, looking at kind of pro proportional visits being done virtually versus in person in, in our primary care clinics. And as you can see, there's a wide range with anywhere from like as low as 18% of uh, visits being done virtually to over half, like 58% in one of the community health centers uh, visits being done virtually. So there's definitely a wide variation here. And if you look at the modality that's being used for virtual visits, uh, you can see that community health centers generally tend to use a little bit less video based uh, platforms and then uh, more sort of phone visits uh, and some practices almost exclusively uh, like 93% of uh, their virtual care is being done vi uh, via video. At the provider level, there's also a considerable variation. Uh, you can see kind of this is percent of visits that uh, were done uh, via video. Um, so the most, uh, most providers fell in the 20 to 39% range, um, but there are like a, at least a handful that are kind of doing like more, more than half of their visits uh, via video. So again, the a very interesting kind of widespread of, um, in, in terms of um, the adoption rate. So what, what kind of explains this variation? I think there are kind of uh, definitely some patient factors. Um, Lee kind of alluded, this, uh, alluded to this as well, but uh, digital access and literacy are probably a major kind of component on the patient side with kind of recent data from JAMA Internal Medicine uh, showing that 30% of Medicare beneficiary uh, lacked kind of adequate digital access or was deemed unready because they just didn't have the experience uh, necessary with technology to, to successfully connect via video. And um, uh, in the uh, uh, next few slides, I'll show like language, patient preference, cost also uh, seems to be a major driver and whether patients uh, adopt video care or not. So this uh, table is from a study that was done out of Kaiser that analyzed about like a one, over 1 million patients who scheduled a primary care appointment through their online portal. And uh, they found that those who are kind of older uh, or male or Hispanic, uh, lived in low SES neighborhoods or didn't speak English, they were all kind of uh, more likely to favor uh, clinic visits rather than video visits. And if you uh, look at other kind of, uh, kind of barriers, potential barriers, uh, like having a high cost uh, uh, deductible or a high cost for uh, office visits, uh, they, they, they were more likely to favor video visits. If they live far away from the clinic, also uh, more likely to favor video visits. And then uh, if they had to pay for parking, uh, they also tended to favor video visits. So all of, all of these financial kind of and time kind of uh, calculations, I think definitely go into patients' um, decision on whether they want uh, video versus in-person uh, care. Um, this again confirms kind of the uh, issue around uh, digital access and literacy where, where people who have uh, less um, broadband access in, in their neighborhood or didn't use kind of mo mobile uh, portal uh, before, uh, didn't really uh, use more clinic, clinic, clinic visits. Interestingly, one of the things that, or that was associated with video visits is if family members were making the appointment on behalf of the patient, they were more likely to choose video, presumably because that'll make it easier for them to kind of be there with the patient to attend the visit. And also, people were um, more likely to favor video visits if they, they were booking an appointment with their own primary care provider uh, and had that continuity. There's a lack of data on sort of what drives this at the provider level, uh, but anecdotally, we've um, kind of heard that lack of comfort with technology probably is one of the biggest things uh, in terms of uh, uh, that's a barrier to adoption. Uh, also, some providers feel um, less comfortable due to the perceived limitations, uh, such as the ability to examine patients. Uh, we also know that uh, COVID-19 kind of uh, had a major impact on uh, people's lives at, at home, and a lot of people needed to kind of work remotely most of the time, and uh, they were uh, therefore doing more virtual visits, or they had kind of underlying health conditions that uh, put them at higher risk of COVID-19 and, again, had to work remotely. So uh, I'm gonna yeah, delve into sort of disparities, like uh, Lee was mentioning, we, this is something we're keeping a close eye on. Um, and uh, unfortunately we do see that if you stratify patients by race, um, the percent of uh, care that's being delivered via video 
drops off considerably uh, in our sort of lower income um, patients, Medicaid and health safe, safety net patients, where uh, it's kind of 14.2% uh, to 4.9% in the health safety net population. And if you look at it uh, by race, uh, sort of um, the most dramatic drop off uh, is really in the Hispanic population, but also we see that the black uh, patients in our, in our primary care community are, are using less uh, video based care. This is looking at uh, kind of age and uh, English proficiency. And uh, I think the, as expected, the kind of the older uh, patients uh, are using mostly uh, kind of phone visits where, and uh, a lot less uh, kind of in-person visits probably because they're afraid to come into the clinic in the, uh, in the setting of the pandemic. And then the, just a big drop off in video-based care uh, for limited English proficiency patients is uh, pretty, pretty stark with four, only 4.3% 4 of visits being conducted via video as opposed to 12.2% at the overall level. This drop off in kind of video visit use is uh, kind of striking, uh, just it's consistent across all insurance types. Um, so whether uh, it's a commercially insurance patient or a Medicaid patient, if you don't speak English, you, you just are much less likely to use uh, video based care. Uh, again, re regardless of race, if you don't speak English, again, the, 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 just the rate of video visit uh, use is uh, kind of low, uh, suggesting that the kind of language barrier is a major kind of um, issue with uh, people accessing our video based care right now. So before I talk about sort of what types of kind of priority areas we have in mind, I will just want to put in a plug for a focus group we'll be having uh, soon. We hope to really get input from all the bright and creative minds that we have in our primary care community to help shape the future of telehealth. So if you are able, please uh, do reach out to Amelia with kind of uh, the time you're available. We'd love to hear from you to really help uh, shape the future of uh, telehealth and primary care. Uh, this uh, league I've mentioned already, but uh, one of the sort of key uh, part of uh, ensuring equity and access to video based care will be launching this uh, official alternative video platform called Doximity. Many of you probably uh, have some experience with this, but it's a lot more user friendly. It doesn't require people to like have a computer. They can join a visit via text message. Don't, you don't need a computer, no broadband access, you don't need gateway, you don't need to download it in Zoom or any other application. So it, it does tend to be a lot more uh, user-friendly and easier option for people to, to access. Other sort of uh, areas of work uh, that are in process include like improving the interpreter workflow. We do recognize it's kind of cumbersome to kind of get an interpreter on, on uh, the call, which is probably why a lot of people are not choosing to do video-based care uh, if they don't speak English. Uh, we also know that Gateway right now is only available in English and Spanish, and that precludes a lot of people from uh, really using Gateway. And that's like a key requirement right now for uh, Epic Integrated Zoom visits. And then ensuring that patient instructions and handouts and um, including kind of text advice from Doximity are available in different languages is, uh, is something else that's being worked on. We think that uh, there may be future inter other interventions that we can uh, consider, including sort of distributing tablets or other devices to patients who don't have um, access to a, a appropriate device at home, uh, help patients sign up for a free low cost uh, broadband access if they're el eligible and uh, also uh, potentially deploying uh, some type of navigator who can really kind of really hold people's hands through, through this uh, process for people we know uh, have a struggle uh, like the elderly folks and kind of people with low uh, digital uh, literacy. I think uh, team-based care also a kind of important goal for us. I think uh, to the extent possible, we wanna make uh, virtual care as seamless and kind of team-based as, as, as uh, in-person care is uh, right now. And that might mean that MAs are kind of consistently rooming patients virtually, uh, taking vital signs, completing questionnaires, troubleshooting technical issues so that pro providers are not sort of uh, struggling, uh, just trying to connect with patients. Uh, RNs can uh, provide kind of virtual teaching around you, how to use an inhaler, glucometers, uh, wound care uh, racks, that kind of stuff. And then we know that PSCs right now are kind of calling people a day or maybe days later to try to uh, do all the checkout process, but we know that people kind of fall through the cracks when, when that uh, happens and hope, uh, look, kind, of, kind of looking towards having uh, some, uh, some real-time check checkout process where providers can hand off a patient virtually to, to the PSC so that uh, a lot of these important checkout processes uh, don't get missed. And um, we, we think there are kind of um, 
uh, obvious use cases for, for virtual care, like kind of like mental health follow-up, chronic disease follow-up, but also, also we think uh, there, there are ways we can expand this use case, um, potentially through additional training on virtual physical exam skills. Also, we know there are a lot of asynchronous sort of um, uh, virtual care modalities like e-visits and questionnaires through Gateway that, that uh, if it's paired with a, the live kind of uh, real-time virtual visit, it might, might uh, really increase the yield of, of these visits. Also, we know uh, having kind of home remote monitoring devices like, like blood pressure monitors would be an important part of ensuring that uh, people, um, people's kind of uh, health concerns are really adequately addressed. And Daniel can probably attest this, uh, but like urgent care and kind of uh, on, on the fly urgent visits for uh, virtually uh, really has potential to improve access and triage. Uh, I know Daniel went as far as getting like a mass and near ophthalmologist uh, on, on a video call to help a patient avert like an ED visit to, to mass and near. Um, and I think there's just, just the potential for kind of uh, real time kind of getting specialty help and, and kind of triaging, um, uh, triaging uh, urgent uh, complaints. Is, 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 there's a lot of potential there. Uh, lastly, I think there are like lots of strength, though the major strength of the virtual platform is really uh, the ease with which uh, patients and providers can attend visits together. So that would, um, we can kind of think about maybe piloting an interdisciplinary care model where we can uh, call an oncologist on demand if we're seeing a patient with newly diagnosed cancer so they can really help uh, kind of guide the patient and the primary care team on, on how, what the best next steps are. Also um, kind of doing uh, serious illness conversation, uh, including patients, uh, loved ones who live remotely is a, I think a kind of a good use case and also uh, virtual group visits, which uh, J Jacob Mursky will talk, be talking about soon. Um, I think has a lot of uh, potential to improve outcomes in our uh, chronic disease measures. And again, I'm really looking forward to hearing what uh, kind of people on this call have, have uh, ideas that you have. So please uh, join our focus groups and kind of give us some, um, Give us your input. Lastly, I just want to thank all of the uh, people who are involved in this um, work, uh, including our virtual care champions listed below. Uh, I know there are a lot of people who are not on this list uh, who did amazing work, so I just want to thank them. I also, also want to just uh, quickly thank Victoria Nixon, who helped prepare for this uh, talk, but uh, more importantly, was just a major um, DJM admin leader uh, in, in this space, and I really uh, couldn't have done this work without her. Thank you. Thanks so much, Andrew, for that tour de force, looking back over, you know, what happened. Um, and, um, you know, it's, it's comforting. And I think also, um, you know, there's a, comforting to understand that we sort of were, uh, were, were in line with national trends, um, um, but also highlights that, you know, the future actually has yet to be determined, right, for what we want to do. And I think there's a lot of great ideas there. Um, so I want to build on some of your comments about, you know, uh, the capacity for, group gatherings virtually to provide healthcare by showing you a pre-recorded video that Jacob Mursky put together for us uh, about his virtual group visit initiative that he has led at Revere and um, hopefully will be, uh, you know, it's starting to expand as well across primary care. So let's, let's roll the tape. We don't hear it. To CME, uh, but I do want to just share a little bit of information about how the Core Health Program, which is a lifestyle medicine focused group visit program at an MGH Revere, has transitioned to virtual group visits um, in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. For those of you who aren't familiar with Core Health, uh, this is a uh, lifestyle medicine-based group visit programming, as I mentioned before, that was started by Dr. Amy Wheeler, who's the unit chief of adult medicine at MGH Revere. Uh, Core stands for the Center for Organized Research and Education for Health. And really the mission of Core when it was first started was to provide patients with the opportunity to learn about lifestyle change, specifically for weight uh, loss and for general health, uh, and to do so in a group visit setting. Now, group visits are also called shared medical appointments, or SMAs, uh, and the concept behind a group visit, for those of you who aren't familiar, 
is to think about the difference between seeing seven patients in a clinic, each for 15 minutes, and maybe only having a few minutes to talk about one of their many chronic medical conditions versus putting all of those seven patients into one room at the same time, same place, and being able to discuss one of those chronic medical conditions for a much more extended period of time. So for example here, you can see that all seven of these theoretical patients on the left have diabetes. And as we all know, in a very busy primary care clinic, maybe the diabetes would get a minute with one patient, three minutes with another, at most five with a third. The concept here is to transition that to really make space to engage in the diabetes care in much more thorough fashion uh, through a group visit. This is a somewhat tongue-in-cheek uh, representation about the differences between an individual visit and a clinic session full of individual visits versus a session with just a group visit. So you can imagine that you still can see seven patients. You can still bill for all seven patients. We bill our group visits at a E3. Uh, but instead of spending just a few minutes, as I mentioned, you're spending 60 to 90 minutes. Now, the other benefits of doing a group visit programming is that both the patient and the providers really enjoy having that much time and space and flexibility to focus on their chronic medical care. And as a result, uh, they also achieve better results, um, which we now know. Uh, for those of you who have been at MGH uh, for several years, uh, in January of 2012, um, there was a fabulous resource that was published uh, in part due to a collaboration with the Stokel Center um, that was uh, entitled Putting Group Visits into Practice. Now, as I mentioned, there is clear benefit uh, that has been established over many years in the literature showing that group medical visits um, or shared medical appointments uh, improve care for obesity, diabetes, hypertension, and heart failure. Although most of those studies were done in person, there's actually no research that's been done on virtual groups. So in the core health program, we have leveraged our full team, which includes me and Dr. Wheeler, uh, as well as Anna Baggett, our health and wellness coach, uh, Nidia, who is our patient uh, coordinator, and Barbara Canada, who is our uh, program director. And we have transitioned our uh, group visit model, which has five different group visit types, one on losing weight, one on lowering blood pressure, one on sleeping better, one on decreasing stress, and one on diabetes care. And we've transitioned it now into virtual group visits. So all of our group visits are now on Zoom. Each of the visits is lasting between 60 and 90 minutes. And we found that Zoom is very easy and actually quite enjoyable to use for the group visit setting. Uh, there is a very low no-show rate in comparison to our prior uh, in-clinic group visit experience. We've also been able to introduce uh, medical interpreters and we conducted our first ever core group visit in Spanish uh, just a month or two ago. We're also now leveraging technology in particular home monitoring uh, programs to inform and educate patients about their own chronic disease care. Um, so this is just a graph on the bottom here from home blood pressure monitoring uh, that patients have been using in my hypertension group visit. And we've also had extreme success uh, in our volume of patients coming into the programming uh, with the last fiscal year of uh, last, uh, the last quarter of the last fiscal year um, being our highest volume ever. Patients are also really enjoying the group visit experience. Uh, this is a uh, uh, quality improvement uh, project that we're getting off the ground that basically looks at patient experience both in the clinic, which is represented with these green bars on the left, um, and now on the virtual groups with the blue bars on the right. And just like before, patients are really enjoying the group visit experiences and getting a lot out of it. If you wanna learn more about the virtual group visit experience and how we've transitioned during COVID, there was an article that was published in Medscape uh, in July that was actually just reposted to the internal medicine news as a featured article. Uh, I don't necessarily endorse the title, um, but the spirit of the article is actually um, very much uh, aligned with the core health mission um, to improve healthy lifestyles through a group visit program. And as we look towards the future, some of the things that we are focusing on now is fully integrating all five of our group visits into the virtual model uh, with diabetes and sleep coming on board this fall. We also are hoping to establish non-English groups as a standard of care. We're very excited to really uh, dive headfirst into collaborations, both within primary care and outside of primary care, and to really start to investigate this in a more rigorous fashion. 
Uh, and I'm happy to also share that the group visit model, virtual group visit model that we've established in Revere is now about to be expanded uh, within the primary care community uh, over this fiscal year to ultimately eight primary care physicians at five other clinics. So thanks very much for taking the time to hear about core health. Again, I apologize for not being able to be present this morning, uh, but please feel free to reach out if you have any questions. Thank you. So now you don't actually have to show up for lectures. It's amazing. Uh, another benefit of the, of the digital era. Um, you know, very grateful to Jacob for preparing that for us. Um, and I think, you know, again, a, a taste or a teaser of what, you know, what is possible as we think about sort of innovative strategies for primary care looking to the future. So we're going to get to Q&A very, very quickly, but I just wanted to do, you know, one final minute of framing just to, just to say that, you know, there is an external environment, right, outside of the Academic Medical Center thinking about virtual care. And I think, you know, the imperative for us um, and the opportunity for us as a primary care community is to think about what our role is in the in the you know virtual care era post COVID, um, um, you know, and and where we're going to sort of seed territory to you know Amwell and Teladoc and and how we will collaborate and how we will differentiate ourselves um, from um, you know these sort of venture funded um, you know for profit um, uh, big tech innovation and investments, um, which are growing very rapidly, um, you know, and, and making a big play to sort of care for patients um, where they are. Um, um, you know, I have a patient on my big little service right now who um, has had his cellulitis, unfortunately now admitted, um, you know, undertreated uh, three times now by Teladoc. Um, you know, but he was able to be in four states um, trying to seek medical care over the course of the pandemic and now ended up back here. So, you know, this is a, there's a lot of interplay and a lot of growth and evolution in this space. Um, and then we'll close um, uh, with, you know, just a Q&A, um, but reflecting on, um, you know, just incredible thanks to uh, Victoria Nixon, Elizabeth Fonseca, Emily Campbell, uh, Larry Stratton, Meg Katarski and all the teams that you know, kind of stood us up through the surge. And really, um, you know, the truth of the matter is for MGH, for the Department of Medicine, I mean, these people took nothing, took a, a starting place of nothing uh, in virtual care and, and got us to a moment where we were doing, you know, 70% of all the ambulatory care, 80%, um, you know, through, through virtual care. Um, and so uh, endless gratitude to all the folks who pitched in. Um, and again, thanks for this opportunity. Thanks very much, uh, Daniel. So um, once again, throw uh, some questions in the chat um, and we'll see if we can uh, screen through and answer some of those. We do have about uh, five, 10 minutes for that. But I think, you know, everyone sort of seeing this has just been impressed in how much we were able to do in such a short period of time, uh, really completely sort of debunking any myths about how things could move uh, quickly in this institution. Now we know the story is out, so uh, we're not gonna have that excuse uh, anymore, but people are listing some ideas in the chat I can see already on some ways we can leverage uh, telehealth to improve the uh, health of our patients. And uh, those are including some ideas about management of hypertension and uh, self-management and ways of thinking about, you know, getting some of our patients who have less resources uh, able to, um, you know, access care uh, when they couldn't. Um, I'll say um, the question to Andrew, uh, from me, Andrew, you know, going forward, um, as far as sort of where you think this is going to settle out in primary care practice. I mean, we saw the graph of the big, you know, sort of uptick during the surge, and now we kind of went down and that line was kind of curving down 30%, 20%. Uh, where are we expecting going forward MGH primary care is going to still be utilizing this? Maybe Daniel can comment as well. 
Yeah, um, so certainly don't, don't have the ability to predict the future um, entirely, but I, I think there's, like I said, I think there's still like a great niche for uh, kind of obvious niches for, for use of um, kind of virtual visits. And I, uh, like the kind of mental health uh, is one thing that's a really, really great fit. And a lot of the chronic disease follow-up is really is kind of cognitive and uh, in nature and the more kind of medication management, counseling, that kind of thing. So I, I think there's a lot of things that in primary care that really fits uh, nicely into the virtual modality. Um, so I, I, I mean, I, I would guess still like maybe uh, kind of we're hitting this plateau around 20, 30 percent. I'm, I'm guessing we'll at least be at that, uh, and if not higher, if we can kind of uh, create other kind of innovative ways to use this. So that would be my sort of um, uh, prediction. And I would, I would add, I think the thing that we learned through the surge, or, or more through the recovery phase, is actually that I think preventive care, right, the pure preventive care counseling conversations you know, the kind of annuals for relatively healthy patients, where it's all about a discussion. <laughs> um, you know, that is extremely amenable to video care. And I would argue that, you know, for those um, conversations between, uh, you know, clinician and patient, where there isn't a need for a physical exam, and it's routine, and there aren't sort of kind of urgent um, assessments that need to be made, um, we learned that, you know, it's a really lovely way to do that by video. I also want to give a, a shout out to a comment from Julie Martin in the chat, who has done incredible work very quickly to get our medical assistants across our practices comfortable um, sort of doing, you know, virtual pre-visit work for our virtual visits. Um, you know, the training there is done. The implementation across 21 practices with a diverse array of needs and staffing challenges will take time but all of our medical assistants do know kind of how to run, you know, a checklist of pre-visit work for virtual care. And similarly, all of our nurses across primary care now do know um, how to set up virtual um, visits, you know, for counseling, uh, for blood pressure follow-up, you know, and I think the sky's the limit there. We're just at, you know, week four of, of, of that training being completed. Um, and so just incredibly grateful to Julie for, um, leading those efforts. And I think the more we can mimic our team-based environment in virtual care, the better up we'll be and the better we'll be able to grow in a stable way. Yeah, Daniel, that's an excellent uh, point about the preventive uh, medicine aspect. Uh, I think I read a good uh, perspective piece in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, talking about how we could deliver preventive care uh, virtually. I think I read that. I highly recommend it if you didn't see uh, Daniel and Jennifer Haas's uh, piece recently. Um, we have a question uh, in the chat about using uh, telehealth virtual care for our kind of after hours on call. And I think some of you have had experience uh, doing that where we've actually set up immediate visits uh, when, when that was needed. Do I take that, Andrew? Sure, yeah. Oh, I thought you were going to take it. I can take oh, it. I can take it. I can take it. Yeah. So I think what, whatever um, sort of kind of inpatient encounter that you think really replaces, uh, like would have otherwise needed an office visit, um, if you're delivering that kind of uh, care virtually, yeah, we do think it's like a billable activity. You just kind of you have to message that to the patient just so they they're not surprised when they get a bill for for after out, uh, like a weekend uh, kind of video visit. But we do think it, it is a billable activity if you're doing something that otherwise they, you would have brought them into the uh, office for uh, like during the week. And and we have the technology built to do that both in Epic. So again, this was something that we built during the surge, and so I'm guessing most people on the call don't even know it exists, which is. That as a, as a physician on a weekend or in the evening, if, again, if you're engaged with the patient already um, and, and sort of feel like a video encounter would be appropriate, there's a mechanism both in Epic with, I think it's really two clicks to schedule what's called an on-the-fly visit um, or, you know, through doximity. And again, I mean, this is N of three patients, but I've done this on my IMA weekend call with rashes, you know, some eye swelling where... I would have otherwise felt like the patient really needs to go to MEI. I mean, getting those pictures in that moment was incredibly valuable in assessing, you know, making in medical decision making. And I think there's a lot of growth opportunity there. 
Great, and uh, maybe uh, time for one final uh, comment and uh, question. Um, the uh, sort of issue around the uh, state lines and out of state uh, patients, which confused greatly, uh, at least myself, uh, during, uh, during the uh, epic surge. Um, where do we think that's gonna go future? Susan had a, a comment uh, as well about what's being done for that. I'll take that. I mean, I think I've learned through this that all I can talk about is now um, and um, uh, for now. <laughs> Nothing has changed there, and, and that is you can care for established patients over state lines and for new patient care over state lines. Um, you know, kind of the party rule for the MGPO and, and, and in collaboration with Cranko is that you can care for new patients over state lines if it's urgent emergent or if the care we, you provide could not be provided locally. Um, and so I think that really depends on your own self-reflection of how special of a, of a physician you are. Um, I, I want to just take one minute to comment on a couple structural things. I saw comments both about camera availability and BP cuffs and scales, and I'm um, pleased to be able to share good news on both of those fronts. We did finally receive word that the shipment of 2,500 cameras, you know, for the Department of Medicine has started to arrive at Assembly Row uh, this week. Um, so now we have to figure out perhaps the more logistical challenge of getting it from Somerville to our 21 primary care practices, and Victoria Nixon is already hard at work, um, sort of trying to figure that out. So I think um, you know, there's 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 cameras coming uh, to Chelsea and all of our other practices, um, you know, funded by uh, you know kind of Mass General Brigham, which is which is great. And then um, similarly, you know, just two weeks ago, we found a small pot of money to purchase 400 blood pressure cuffs that will be you know digitally connected and 400 digitally connected scales as well for distribution across primary care. I don't yet have a plan for um, how to you know, best distribute them or utilize them. Um, uh, and we are hopeful and we have planned to use things like the concierge, you know, primary care innovation funds you know, this year um, to purchase a, even a larger allocation of those things for you know, intended for patients who cannot uh, purchase them on their own or do not have you know, payer support for uh, blood pressure machines and things like that. Um, so more to come there, but but you know, our it's heartening. I think that our thoughts are all aligned here. Great. Um, so uh, with that good news, um, I'll welcome everyone to turn on their cameras if you haven't already uh, turned them on, and uh, virtually applaud our uh, discussants. Thank you very much for uh, joining us. Um, thanks everyone for uh, coming. It's great to see such good turnouts uh, in the, uh, the Zoom world here. So everyone have a good weekend. Thank you. Thank you for having us.